Good afternoon, everybody. Now, starting today, we um, are going to go through the infectious cycle. And I presume you all remember what that is. Those are all the steps that viruses do when they infect the cell. Starting with today, we're going to talk about attachment and entry into cells. So this will last, I don't know, seven or eight uh, lectures, and we'll go through the individual steps in, in some detail. And that'll be the first half of the course. And then following that, we're going to move into how viruses cause disease. So today, we're talking about getting into cells, attachment and entry. And uh, the, the problem here, of course, is that viruses need to get into cells to replicate, right? They're obligate intracellular parasites, but they can't simply diffuse through the membrane. They're too big. And so there have to be active ways that the viruses are taken up into cells. So that's going to be one aspect of what we're talking about today. And the other part of the equation is that, remember, virions are metastable. They are stable in the environment, but on some cue, they come apart and give up their genome. And that's going to play a big role in today, in today's discussion. We're going to talk about how metastability is used to get uh, viruses into cells. Now, viruses are floating around in the air, in fluids. They contact you. Let's say they get into your respiratory tract. They're diffusing and moving around. And their, their collision with the cell is purely by chance. Because they are inanimate. They have no means of moving around. They have no locomotion. They're driven by diffusion, Brownian motion, and electrostatics. And they can bind anything in your respiratory tract or your intestine. They can bind food. Uh, they can bind mucus many different things. And that's why numbers of viruses are important for initiating an infection. Usually you don't start an infection with just one because there's so much uh, other stuff that bi viruses can bind to. But <clears throat> in order to initiate an infection, they have to bind to the right cell. And that starts with adhering to the surface non-specifically, simply through electrostatic interactions. And then seeing if that cell has a receptor on the surface to which uh, the virus can specifically bind. So there are lots of initial collisions between viruses and cells. Uh, and at some point, the, one of those collisions uh, ends up in the virus interacting with a specific receptor. So we're going to take a little time now and talk about receptor molecules for viruses. Uh, sometimes there is one receptor for a virus. Sometimes there's more than one. It really depends on the virus. And then the next step is to transfer the genome into the cell. <clears throat> and that can happen at a number of places depending on the virus. And as always, we'll try and simplify all the different things that happen and look at some unifying principles. Now, for all viruses that we will talk about, they require cellular receptors to initiate infection. The exceptions are some viruses of yeasts that don't actually have extracellular phases. They go from yeast to yeast as the cell divides. So they don't need to have a receptor on the cell surface. And some plants, well, plant viruses in general uh, don't bind to receptors, but rather get into the cell by mechanical damage, the breaking of the cell, or an insect bringing the virus into the cell. But we're not going to talk much about those in this course. We're talking mainly about animal viruses and uh, mammalian viruses and bacteriophages that bind to receptors. And there are what we call receptors and co-receptors. This is really an accident of discovery. Usually the first protein that a virus needs to get into the cell is called a receptor. And then the second one is called a co-receptor. So for HIV, you'll see receptor and co-receptor. But really, they both deserve to be receptors. So even though the, name, the words are in the literature, I'm not sure they mean so much. As late as 1985, we only knew one virus receptor. That was sialic acid for influenza virus, and we'll talk about that a bit today. But uh, right after that year, there was a lot of progress in the field. The, the availability of monoclonal antibodies, recombinant uh, DNA technology and cloning, DNA-mediated transformation, all of these pushed the field forward. And now we know many, many virus receptors, and th they seem to be identified every month. So here are some picornavirus receptors. These are receptors for viruses of my favorite virus family. And you can see they're all displayed on the plasma membrane. They're different kinds. There are some that 
have these domains which are called immunoglobulin-like domains. If you're familiar with the antibody molecule, it has a so-called Ig domain in it, and that's what these little loops are. And there are a number of virus receptors that, that are members of that protein family. But you can see there are all sorts of surface proteins that are virus receptors. There are some that are GPI-linked. Uh, Low-density lipoprotein receptor involved in cholesterol metabolism is a receptor for a virus. And vi uh, molecules from the immune system, these integrins. The bottom line here is that almost every cell kind of cell surface protein can be a receptor for a virus. And of course, they don't exist for viruses, right? It's the first thing you have to remember. These receptors weren't placed there so that viruses could attach to them. They happen to be normal cell proteins with their own functions, and viruses have evolved to bind to different ones. Some viruses bind more than one receptor, and sometimes one receptor binds uh, more than one virus. So for example, there is a receptor on the cell called CAR, C-A-R, and it stands for Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor. And that is because it can bind either of these two viruses. They're very different viruses. Remember, adenovirus is the icosahedral virus with the fibers coming out. And you'll see those fibers are what bind the receptor. And Coxsackie is also icosahedral, but it has no fibers. Yet they bind the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor. Coxsackie virus, by the way, is named after Coxsackie, New York. It's exit 21B on the New York State Thruway, right, Saul? The Thruway. Anybody from Coxsackie, New York? No. It was named there because there was an outbreak in the 40s, which was thought to be polio, and it turned out to be a different virus, so they named it after the town. Uh, a swine herpes virus called pseudorabies virus happens to bind the same receptor as polio virus. These are two totally different viruses. Herpes viruses are enveloped, polio virus is not, yet they bind the same receptor. And viruses of the same family may bind different receptors. Rhinoviruses, there are three different receptors at least for rhinoviruses. Retroviruses, at least 16 different receptors. It's remarkable diversity. So there are lots of variations in virus receptor interactions. That's the point of all this. So let's talk about how viruses attach to receptors first. And we'll consider two different kinds of viruses, the viruses with icosahedral capsids and then envelope viruses because they bind in different ways. So here is how poliovirus binds to its receptor. On the upper left is the icosahedral capsid of polio. And you notice these things that are sticking out of the capsid. Uh, those are the receptor molecules. So what's been done here is the receptor protein has been produced in a soluble form. That is not bound to the plasma membrane. As you remember perhaps from a few slides ago, most of these receptor proteins are transmembrane proteins, right? So the poliovirus receptor, this one was produced by making a version without the transmembrane domain. Then it was mixed with virus, and so each receptor molecule is binding the virus. And then the, stru the structure was solved by cryo electron microscopy and image reconstruction. So it's a low resolution structure, but you can see very clearly individual receptor molecules binding to the capsid. And what's really interesting is that around each five-fold axis of symmetry, here's one five-fold axis right there, there are one, two, three, four, five receptor molecules. That's what five-fold means, right? There are five copies of the protein subunit around it. And in fact, you would predict that there would be 60 copies of the receptor bound because of icosahedral symmetry, and that's in fact what you get. This is saturated with receptor. You can tell which end of the receptor is fitting in here. There happen to be sugar groups on the receptor, so you can orient it by those bumps. And basically the way this receptor fits into the virus particle is shown here on the right, upper right. Here's a cross section of the virus, uh, and here's the receptor fitting in. There is a little uh, depression on the surface of the virus particle. Some people call it a canyon, and it, that's just where the receptor fits in. Of course, there are interactions between the receptor amino acids and the virus. These are not covalent, right? These are just other kinds of non-covalent interactions. So that's polio. Here's rhinovirus, which is a member of the same family. It's an icosahedral virus. The receptor for this kind of rhino is low-density lipoprotein receptor. 
and again, in this picture, a soluble form of that receptor was produced and bound to virus. And here you see it binds to a different place. Uh, it's binding up on what we call the plateau. So there is also a plateau in polio. It would be right here at the five-fold axis. And if this, on the upper right, were rhinovirus, the receptor would be binding right up there. Uh, so the rhinovirus binds there. It doesn't bind in the canyon. So you see there are lots of places where receptors can bind on these ca capsids, canyons, uh, or on the surface as well. So those are icosahedral viruses. Now, how about an envelope virus? Influenza virus is a great model to use for this. Remember, influenza is an envelope virus with a couple of different kinds of proteins in the envelope. The two major ones are the hemagglutinin, the HA, and the neuraminidase. The HA is the molecule, it's the purple one here, it's in most numbers. It's the molecule that attaches to the cell receptor. For all influenza viruses, the cell receptor is a sugar. It's a, it's a molecule of sialic acid and the virus binds to it and we're going to look at that in some detail. So sialic acids are typically part of glycoproteins on cells, often on the cell surface. In fact, every one of our cells on our body has sialic acid in some form on it. It's typically the last sugar on the chain of sugars that's attached to a protein. So here's a glycoprotein here on the upper left and a glycoprotein ha has sugar chains attached to it and when sialic acid is present it's only, always terminal. It's always the last sugar. And sialic acid is the, sh is the receptor for influenza virus. So in fact if you make soluble sialic acid it will bind influenza virus by itself. But it, when a vi virus infects a cell, of course, it's recognizing sialic acid on a glycoprotein. So here is sialic acid here uh, on the top. This is the, it's a six carbon sugar, of course, with side groups of various sorts. Another name for it is N-acetylneuraminic acid, right, sialic acid. And depending on what, the way it is linked to the second sugar in the chain, uh, determines the specificity for different kinds of influenza viruses. So here is an alpha-2-3 linkage between the two sugars. It can also be linked in an alpha-2-6 manner to this six carbon via uh, a, a, an oxygen bond there as well. All right, so influenza viruses will bind to either sialic acids linked alpha-2-3 or SU-2-6. Our respiratory tracts have largely alpha-2-6 sialic acids in the upper and lower tract and human influenza viruses like that we have alpha 2 3 in our lower tract though not much in our upper tract and avian influenza virus strains prefer alpha 2 3 linked sialic acids and this is one reason why it's not so easy to be infected with avian influenza virus strains because the receptors are way down in your lungs and you have to inhale pretty deeply a large aerosol in order to be infected. But it does happen, and you may know that occasionally people die of influenza H5N1, which is an avian strain that binds alpha-2-3. We'll talk more about that later. It's a very interesting story. So here's the crystal structure or the x-ray structure of the hemagglutinin of flu. Again, this is a glycoprotein on the surface of the particle that attaches to the cell receptor. Uh, it's embedded in the viral membrane. It's a transmembrane protein. It has a fibrous stem and at the top is a globular head and the head contains the sialic acid binding site. And in fact, here is a structure of sialic acid in yellow bound in the head of the hemagglutinin. So we know exactly how it sits in there. We know all the kinds of interactions between the sialic acid and specific amino acid residues of the hemagglutinin. Now here um, is how HIV attaches to cells. I think this is a movie, but I'm not sure. Let's see. This HIV, of course, is another uh, enveloped glycoprotein. Is this a movie or not? Somewhere there's a movie. Maybe it's later. Okay, it must be later. This is an image of... Um, HIV binding. No, that is a movie. No, it's not. Sorry, I'm very sorry. I'm all, I'm all confused. Uh, this is a picture of HIV binding to its receptor. We'll see a movie of it later. HIV virions um, with glycoproteins on its surface. It has a glycoprotein very much like the flu HA. 
Um, there are not many of them on the surface of the particle. That's an interesting observation. It's pretty sparse, as you can see here. And uh, this binds to both a receptor and a co-receptor on the virus on the cell surface. So there's a receptor, which is CD4 for HIV, and there's a co-receptor, which is a chemokine receptor that is also needed. And there's going to be a movie of this later, um, of that happening. Adenoviruses, remember, are those icosahedral viruses with, uh, yes? With the HIV, it seemed that the, um, it was very random, the placement. Of the glycoproteins? Is that just my Maybe it's an artist's interpretation. So the question is, the uh, glycoproteins seem random. They are very few on the surface of the particle. Um, and so they may be uh, arranged randomly in this way. Um, so remember, flu is, uh, they're quite dense on the surface. Well, you can't see it here, but on an electron micrograph, they would be right next to each other. So yeah, they're, um, they probably look something like this. And this is one reason why it's hard to neutralize HIV with antibodies because there's, these proteins are spaced so far apart. Uh, adenovirus, remember the odd looking icosahedron with the fibers? The very tip of the fiber has a knob protein on it. Right there you can see it. And that, by, that is shown right here. Uh, and that interacts with the cellular receptor on the cell surface. All right, so that's a couple of uh, examples of how viruses bind to receptors. There are lots and lots of specific interactions that we know about, but those are really the major principles, how an icosahedral virus can bind either to the surface or to these fibers. And typically envelope viruses with glycoproteins, the glycoproteins bind to the receptor. The next step is that the virus has to be taken up into the cell, and viruses use cellular pathways to do that. They don't invent anything. They use endocytic pathways, and now we, we think they're using some other uh, uptake pathways as well. So in general, cells do take a lot of things into them. They phagocytose, as you know, big particles, and they endocytose smaller particles. And there's a process called pinocytosis, or cellular drinking, where the, the membrane, the plasma membrane of a cell is always invaginating and, and breaking off vesicles and taking in the extracellular contents. And it, just recently, it's been found that some viruses actually get into cells this way. Uh, what we mainly know about virus entry is that they utilize the receptor-mediated endocytic pathway. Uh, this is a pathway by which ligands are taken into the cell. The ligands bind receptors on the cell surface. Uh, the cell surface invaginates, becomes vesicles, and then move into the cell via the endocytic pathway. So viruses do this. You can imagine this is a virus particle binding its receptor. It then gets taken up into the cell uh, by endocytosis. So we're going to look at a couple of examples of this in some detail. Now moving within the cell. Um, when I was young, the textbooks that I looked at in biology, the cytoplasm was empty. Maybe there was a mitochondrion or a ribosome here and there. But that's obviously not the way it is. This is more like what the cytoplasm looks like. Here's the plasma membrane. And then you have some uh, cytoskeletal elements right below it. And moving into the cell, you see it's completely packed. There's some ribosomes in here. And moving further down into the cell, here's the ER, uh, and here's a clathrin-coated vesicle. And then moving further in, here's the nucleus. Here's a nuclear pore and things moving through it. And then, of course, our nucleosome DNA in the nucleus. So it's really jam-packed. <coughs> but viruses have to move through this. They don't diffuse. There's just no way they would diffuse. It would take forever. So here's a, here's a uh, thought experiment which was done to make this point. These are estimated rates of transport of viruses either in water or the cytoplasm. So we take uh, the polio capsid, for example, the time to travel 10 microns in water, 3.85 seconds. In the cytoplasm, if you apply a viscosity factor of some sort, it would take a half an hour to move 10 microns, which isn't a lot. Herpes virus would take 14 in some seconds to move 10 microns in water, two hours to move in the cytoplasm, and vaccinia would take five hours to move just by diffusion. So the point here is that viruses don't diffuse. They're actively transported uh, along cellular pathways. And this next slide is a summary of some of these transport pathways uh, that we'll talk about. And you can see here viruses here, they can enter at the plasma membrane. Trans this is a particular virus that has to get to the nucleus. You can see it's, 
it's moving down a microtubule carried by a motor, in this case dynein, the motor that brings things towards the centrosome. All right, so eventually that capsid will make it to the nucleus where it wants to go. Uh, some viruses are taken in by endocytosis, it can be clathrin dependent, it can be clathrin independent, it can be caviolin dependent. <laughs> doesn't matter. In all cases, the movement of the endocytic vesicles occurs along microtubules. It's driven by motors that move the vesicles along with the virus in it until the virus gets out, and we'll see how that happens a bit later on. All right, so the, the point here is that things don't just diffuse in the cytoplasm. They have to move using energy, and that's what viruses do. So here we have our first movie, which is an animation of a vesicle moving along a microtubule with dynein motors. And this is, of course, a little unrealistic because it's not crowded enough in here. There's not enough stuff around, but uh, this would be a vesicle. A virus could be in there, an endocytic vesicle. There's your dynein motor uh, walking along the microtubule. It just looks so human, right, the way it's walking. So that gives you an idea of how this is happening. And of course, every step of the motor requires hydrolysis of, uh, of an energy molecule. So this could be a virus in there. So this is a great company that does scientific animation, Ex, Ex Vivo. I think we'll be looking at a couple of those. Now some viruses, as you might have seen on that previous uh, summary slide, actually fuse at the plasma membrane. and you know, depending on what the virus is, that may be all that they have to do. So here we have a paramyxovirus, which is an envelope virus, negative strand RNA. It's fusing at the plasma membrane. So it's binding a receptor, and then fusion occurs, and then the helical capsid, the RNA protein complex, is in the cytoplasm, and that's all it needs to go. It doesn't need to go anywhere else. It doesn't have to get to the nucleus and it can start making messenger RNAs right there. So let's talk a little bit about how these fusion reactions occur. So again, this is a paramyxovirus that fuses at the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane, of course, is neutral pH. And I'm telling you that because in a, in a few moments we'll contrast this with an acid-dependent fusion mechanism. So here the virus is binding a receptor. There's a viral glycoprotein interacting with whatever the receptor is. Uh, and we're now looking that up in an in a expanded view here in part B. So here's the viral membrane, and there's a protein, a glycoprotein called the HN protein that stands for hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. That will bind a receptor. Okay, so here you see the <coughs> virus is attaching to the cell receptor, which is the red molecule here on the plasma membrane. And then the next thing that's going to happen is there's a conformational change in this neighboring protein this green protein, which is called the F or the fusion protein. This is the protein that's actually going to fuse the two membranes. Uh, what happens here is when the receptor of the virus engages with the receptor in the cell, uh, that transmits a conformational change to the fusion peptide, which can then unfold, it fits into the cell membrane, and the two, the two membranes are brought close together and then they can fuse. They can undergo fusion so that the virus membrane and the cell membrane become one and the viral RNA can get out. So it's, it's a brilliant scheme. Now you see here in these initial stages, the fusion protein is folded back. And that's because you don't want this fusion peptide exposed. This is a short amino acid sequence of highly hydrophobic amino acids. If it gets close to any membrane, it's going to fuse with it. So these viruses don't want to be bumping around into various membranes and fusing at will. If they bump into the wrong cell, they're going to lose their nucleic acid because it can't replicate. So the fusion peptide is kept hidden against the virus membrane until the virus finds the right receptor. Then that signals a trigger, fusion protein expands, fusion can happen. So this is an example of a spring-loaded interaction that we talked about I think last time. These viruses are spring-loaded to uncoat, but only in the right cell. And here the signal is simply interacting with the right receptor. So that's one example which happens with measles viruses. On the bottom is what happens with HIV. And this is a more complicated situation, but basically the virus again has a glycoprotein with a part, here it's labeled SU. Uh, this is the part that will attach uh, to the receptor. And here's the fusion peptide. It's hidden against the membrane again, just like in the paramyxoviruses. 
with HIV, there need to be two receptors engaged in order to get fusion. And it also occurs at the cell surface, by the way. First, this yellow SU portion binds CD4. CD4 is a molecule present on CD4 positive T cells. This is why the virus uh, preferentially infects those cells. Uh, it binds CD4. The binding then exposes a portion of this SU protein so that it can bind the co-receptor. So you see this little loop here is now bumping out. This is sort of a shorthand for conformational change. Now SU can also bind the, co the chemokine receptor, which is one of the other receptors for HIV CCR. And then finally, when both molecules are engaged, then the signal goes to the fusion peptide here. It's called TM. It flips out, inserts into the cell membrane, and then the two membranes fuse. So in general, fusion happens when you bring two membranes very close together. You have to bring them right next to each other, get rid of all the water molecules in between, and then they will fuse. It's not easy to do. It's hard. And that's why you have to use a protein like this fusion protein to engage and then pull them together. All right, so that's two different ways of fusing at the surface, either using um, just a single receptor or one receptor or two receptors engaging the, the same viral glycoprotein. All right, so here's another movie. This is of HIV entry into the cell. This is a, a different animation company, but this is also pretty well done. Here you can see the glycoproteins are evenly distributed. The artist's license, they decided it looked better this way. So the virus is here in the blood, red blood cells. These are CD4 positive lymphocytes. And the virus is going to run into one of those. And on the surface of the CD4 lymphocyte are the two receptor molecules, CD4, and the chemokine receptor, CCR. And looming in the background is our virion, which is going to approach. And these are the glycoproteins on the virion surface. They're going to, these are going to be interacting. And this is actually the fusion peptide. You can see it's buried up there against the virus membrane. So it doesn't spontaneously fuse with anything. So first, the virus engages CD4. And then there's a conformational change. And then the, re the uh, glycoprotein can then engage the chemokine receptor. And once those two things happen, well, the artist decided to get rid of everything. <laughs> but they remain. And the fusion peptide expands, inserts into the plasma membrane. This is accompanied by what's called a hair pinning. The, the peptide begins to bend. And that draws the two molecules, uh, the, the virus and the, and the cell, very close together, which is what you need in order to get fusion. And the viral membrane fuses with that of the cell. And here's the nucleocapsid uh, entering the cell. And this, of course, has the nucleic acid in it and the enzymes that are needed to, uh, to copy it. So that's HIV entry. Now, influenza virus entry is, is the best studied. And this is a cartoon of that. Uh, and remember, these viruses bind sialic acid. The HA of the virus binds sialic acid. They get taken up into the cell by endocytosis. So now this is an example of an endocytic route of uptake. Virus gets taken into the cell. Here at each step uh, is a cartoon of the hemagglutinin bound to sialic acid. So here is the viral membrane, the cell membrane. These are the heads of the hemagglutinin binding sialic acid, which isn't shown here. And I want to point out here the red sequences down near the viral membrane. Those are the fusion peptides. Again, they're hidden. In general, you have to hide these fusion peptides because they will fuse with the wrong cell if they're exposed. So as these endosomes move into the cell, as you know, they become acidified. There are pumps in the endosome membrane that actively transport protons into the interior, becomes acidified, and at about a pH of 5 to 6, that causes a conformational change in the hemagglutinin. So these fusion peptides flip up, and they insert into the cell membrane. You can see it going from down by the viral membrane into the cell. The heads of the HA fall away, <clears throat> and then uh, this entire HA begins to hairpin, it bends, it draws the two molecules together, and eventually the virus membrane and the endosome membrane fuses 
and the viral ribonucleoprotein can exit the capsid or exit the virus particle. So it's an acid catalyzed, it's a low pH catalyzed fusion between the virus and the cell membrane and it's carried out by the HA molecule. So low pH does all of this. It's really remarkable. These, uh, these steps in this process are known because we have a crystal structure of, of the different intermediates in the HA. So here on the left uh, is um, the HA molecule in its native state at, at neutral pH. Here's the globular head and the fibrous stem. This is a trimer. The active molecule is a trimer. And I forgot to point out to you, this is three separate individual molecules here. That's why you see three heads. In order for this molecule to undergo these dramatic conformational changes at low pH, it has to be cleaved has to be cleaved right down here in this yellow loop where it says cleavage site. And that is because the fusion peptide is located in this loop. So there's another control to make sure that fusion doesn't occur randomly. They have the fusion peptide buried in a sequence which has to be exposed by cleavage. So here's the uncleaved form, here's the cleaved form that now gives you an N-terminus which contains that fusion peptide. And finally this is the low pH form of the HA. This fusion peptide has now been extended to the top of this alpha helix right here. So normally uh, this alpha helix is shorter. Uh, at low pH, the fusion peptide extends the length of the alpha helix and the fusion peptide is right up here. So it can be inserted into the membrane. So once again, the cleavage is needed to expose that fusion peptide and low pH then brings it to the top of the molecule so that it can insert uh, into the cell membrane. And I, I talked before about this hair pinning uh, idea, and this is a cartoon of that. So here's a hemagglutinin trimer, it's simplified. Uh, it's, it's, um, here it's just shown in a pre-fusion state. Uh, at low pH, the fusion peptides extend to insert into the cell membrane. So virus is down here, cell is at the top. Uh, and these, of course, are, are multimers. And then you see the hair pinning occurring. So the whole hemagglutinin is bending, and we know this happens. We've seen this happen structurally. And when it bends, it brings the two membranes together. So they're very close. They exclude water molecules, and then they can fuse. And then you get a pore form that expands, and then the, R the viral RNA comes out. So low pH-mediated fusion requires exp exposure of the fusion peptide by the low pH. It requires a cleavage of the protein to expose the and terminal fusion peptide, and hair pinning is what brings uh, the, the membranes close together. Now this, this protein, this hemagglutin of influenza virus, is very much like uh, the glycoproteins of a few other viruses, uh, SV5, a paramyxovirus, Ebola virus, HIV1, a retrovirus of mice. These all have these very similar trimeric fusion proteins, which are all shown here in their extended low pH conformation. So they all exist on the surface, folded up, burying the fusion peptide, and they all rearrange at low pH. And these are called class I fusion proteins. They're typically perpendicular to the membrane, mostly alpha helical, as you can see, and they all form trimers. There are a couple of other kinds of fusion proteins. Uh, they're, they're class II, which are very different. You can see them here. Uh, these are mostly beta sheets. You see there's very little alpha helices in these uh, type 2 fusion proteins. They form dimers typically instead of trimers. And they're parallel to the membrane. So in contrast to the influenza HA and the other type 1 fusion proteins, the type 2 are parallel to the membrane. Now they, this is how they would look like on the virus particle, these type 2 uh, fusion proteins. Here is dengue virus. Uh, with the type 2 fusion proteins laying on its surface. So this actually does work even though you think that by lying on the surface it wouldn't. And there's also type 3 fusion proteins which are like the HA of flu and the type 1s. These are perpendicular to the membrane. They tend to be a mix of alpha helices and beta sheets. They also form trimers. And you find these in rabies and herpes viruses. These uh, type 2 fusion proteins that lie on the membrane. They also hide their fusion protein, just like the type 1 fusion proteins. Uh, so here are just two different kinds of type 2 
uh, fusion proteins from an alpha virus and a flavy virus, and they showed two different mechanisms of, of this hiding. Uh, in the alpha virus, uh, the fusion peptides, which are shown as these loops here, these are, these are trimers or dimers, uh, the fusion peptides are hidden by a second protein. Okay, and then the second protein is cleaved and moved out of the way in order to get fusion. So very much like the HA has to be cleaved, these have to be cleaved, but it's not the actual fusion peptide in this case, it's a second peptide that, that masks it, if you will. And here for the flavivirus uh, fusion proteins, again, the peptides are hidden close to the membrane, and at low pH, these rise up and insert uh, into the cellular membrane. So very, very similar um, mechanisms for all of these fusion peptides. The most important thing, I think, is really to hide the fusion peptide so that it doesn't simply fuse with everything. So fusion is always regulated, okay? It can't occur in the wrong place. Evolution has selected for viruses that have mechanisms to regulate fusion because if you do it in the wrong cell, you don't succeed. You can't replicate and you never make it to the next step. You become extinct. Often proteolytic cleavage activates the fusion protein for cleavage. Remember, we saw that with the hemagglutinin of influenza uh, for class one. For class two, a cleavage of a second protein can activate it. Uh, and then, of course, low pH in many cases also uh, triggers fusion. Now, back to the influenza virus uh, story. I want to tell you one more uh, thing about this entry step, which is quite interesting. Remember, the virus is taken into the endosome at low pH. The HA undergoes a conformation that puts the fusion peptide into the cell membrane. It hairpins, and fusion occurs. Now, as this is happening, uh, th remember, there, there are protons being pumped into uh, the interior of the endosome. Remember, the virus also has a channel in its membrane, the M2 ion channel, which we talked about last time. And the function of that occurs right at this step. These protons that are pumped in by the endosomal pumps then flow through uh, the M2 ion channel and enter the interior of the virion. That is not needed for fusion of the H mediated by the HA. Rather, those protons that are flowing into the virion, they have to get in there to dissociate the RNA of the virus so that it can get out. So these um, RNAs here would stick to the membrane even when the fusion event occurred if the interior of the, of the particle hadn't been acidified by, by the flow of these protons. And this then allows them to enter uh, the cell. I think we have a movie of this. Yes, so here's influenza virus entry. And here there are uh, a few things wrong, or maybe one thing wrong, but here they're calling this a capsid, which uh, I, I wouldn't do. This is an M protein, sh which is a shell of sorts below the membrane, but it wouldn't be described as a capsid. But more on that in a moment. So here's the influenza virus with its HA and its uh, NA glycoproteins. And here it is bumping around on an epithelial surface in your respiratory tract. It's going to interact with a receptor that has sialic acid uh, on it. It's taken into the cell by the endocytic pathway. Part of that is a clathrin-coated pit, which then pinches off and becomes a clathrin-coated vesicle, moves into the cell. At some point, the clathrin will fall off which is part of the endocytic pathway here. It's moving along a microtubule, which is correct. It doesn't move freely here. The clathrin is coming off. Presumably now the pH has been dropping as the vesicle moves so that now you get a fusion event which deposits the ribonucleoproteins here into the cytoplasm and then they get imported into the nucleus because that's where uh, they're going to replicate and they go through the nuclear pore. Now there is one thing that's not quite right about this. Now, I know I'm a little fussy, but after all, this is, this is what I do for a living, right? So I have a right to be fussy. This is not a capsid, and I think, well, let's look on the next slide. I took a, f a capture of this. So here's what they're labeling a capsid. This is technically not a capsid. This is simply an M protein shell. The M protein is, be is below the membrane of many viruses. It gives the membrane stability, but it doesn't really form a capsid like that on its own. But what's even worse is they've got it making triangles. That's what icosahedra do, right? Icosahedra have the triangular faces, and influenza symmetry is not icosahedral by any means. But yet they've made 
the M protein into an icosahedron. So they've confused their um, morphologies a bit. So one day when some of you become illustrators, I hope you remember that when you make your, your virus entry movie. So this is not a capsid and these are not icosahedral uh, in symmetry. So the, again, the, the M protein of influenza is simply a supporting protein below the membrane. It doesn't really form a capsid on its own. If you took the membrane away, it wouldn't exist as a capsid. Here's entry of another uh, virus which has those type 2 glycoproteins, the ones that lie on the cell surface parallel. This is taken up uh, by endocytosis. The vesicle is moving down a microtubule. And as the interior acidifies, the glycoproteins stand up, right? These are raising up, reaching towards the membrane. The fusion peptides are at the tips there. I like the acidification effect, all the sparkly stuff, right? So here are the fusion peptides inserting into the endosome membrane. They're going to hairpin right now and draw the membranes closer. You see this, this cell membrane being drawn very close. The walking is a little extra. It looks insectoid, but okay. Here, you see the two membranes brought close together. Now they can fuse. And then the contents, of course, will come out. The viral RNA can then come out and go into the cytoplasm. And here the, the viral RNA is a single molecule, so si simply comes out in the cytoplasm, it's plus stranded, so it can be engaged by ribosomes uh, right away. So, so these movies are actually not so, not so bad. They just have a few things uh, here and there. All right, now, um, very recently, we have, uh, others have found a new paradigm for virus entry, and this is uh, demonstrated by the, the phyloviruses. <coughs> Uh, or a filovirus, whichever your, your choice is. And this is, for example, Ebola virus or uh, Marburg virus. These are thread-like viruses, which of course are very lethal. They don't cause a lot of infections globally, but when they do, uh, you're not, not in very good shape. So they're characterized by an envelope that has this very unusual thread-like uh, appearance. And the envelope is studded with glycoproteins, GP, you can see here. And of course, the GP is what binds the receptor and what gets uh, the virus into the cell. And uh, this is the scheme of phylovirus entry. So again, it's an envelope virus binding to a receptor. We don't actually know what the receptor is uh, on the cell surface. It hasn't been identified yet, but presumably the virus has to bind to something. Uh, here's a schematic of the glycoprotein that would be on the particle. Now you can see here it says macropinocytic uh, uptake. So remember, pinocytosis is what we call cellular drinking. It's a constant process by which the cell is invaginating its plasma membrane and taking up extracellular material. So the idea here, there are markers of, of pinocytic uptake, and so the idea is that these viruses use this pathway, and they probably attach to a receptor and just get taken up into these pinocytic vesicles. Eventually, though, these pinocytic vesicles traffic to late endosomes, so they move into the endocytic pathway, as you can see here. So this Ebola virus is attached to its receptor in the endosome, moving into the cell. Now, the first thing that happens is the glycoprotein of the virus gets cleaved uh, by a cysteine protease that's in the lumen uh, of the endosome. And this removes this pink cap from the viral glycoprotein. And that presumably makes it competent for the subsequent fusion reaction. Because if you leave, um, if you don't cleave this glycoprotein, the virus cannot get into the cell. Once that cleavage occurs, the next thing that happens is the virus binds to an, an endosomal protein called NPC1. So this stands for neiman pick protein 1, because Neiman, people with Neiman-Pick disease have a defect in this protein, and they have a problem transporting cholesterol. They tend to accumulate it in deposits uh, in the cell, and this leads to uh, neurological problems. So Neiman-Pick uh, fibroblasts are deficient in this uh, receptor, and they cannot be infected uh, by Ebola virus. So the virus apparently binds to NPC1 in the endosome. So we haven't seen this yet before. We've talked about binding up on the plasma membrane, but this is the first time now we have two sets of binding, first at the plasma membrane, and then a second interaction 
in the endosome. And that binding is thought to trigger fusion so that the viral uh, nucleic acid, which is shown here in the cytoplasm, can get out of the endosome. All right. And you have to have cleavage of the glycoprotein in order to have this fusion trigger. So the virus can get into the cell with its cap still on, if you will, but if it's not cleaved, it will not fuse with MPC1. So this is really a, a new way of getting in because here we have a fusion receptor in the endosome. So the virus finds it by moving into the endocytic pathway. It binds to it uh, and then gets out into the cytoplasm in that way. So that's, that's really a new thing. It's only been discovered in the past few years. And um, one of the things that helped was having fibroblasts from patients with NPC Neiman Pick disease, which don't have the protein and they're resistant to infection. Now people with the disease typically die very young, so it doesn't confer any advantage to them in terms of resistance to virus infection. But it's, uh, it's been very useful for studying uh, this pathway. Another uh, paradigm I want to show you is how an envelope, a non-enveloped virus uh, gets out of the endosome. So here is adenovirus. Remember, this is binding to cell receptors by these fiber receptors here. They're taken up by endocytosis. They end up in an endosome, and as you know, the pH drops in an endosome. With adenovirus, as the pH drops in the endosome, the particle begins to disassemble. As you can see, the pieces are falling off. The fibers come off at low pH. And then there's another protein which is usually buried in the capsid. It's shown here by these diamonds, these yellow diamonds. At low pH, those proteins come out of the capsid. And those poke holes into the endosome membrane. They lyse the endosome membrane, as you can see here. And the partially disassembled capsid gets out. So it's partially disassembled. It's not all disassembled, so it's still somewhat intact. It can then get out. It rides down the microtubules to the nucleus, docks onto a nuclear pore, and puts its genome in, in the nucleus. So a unique strategy for getting out of the endosome. You make a toxin or a, a, a protein that pokes holes in it. <clears throat> and again, you have to hide that protein in the intact virion so it doesn't act in the wrong place. Here's a, a very nice EM <clears throat> of an adenovirion moving down uh, a microtubule in a cell. You can see the particle there, there's a microtubule. And here is an EM of two adenoviruses, uh, this one sitting on a nuclear pore complex. So this is docked onto the complexes and about to put its uh, uh, DNA into the nucleus. So this makes sense to you because you know that the virus with a double-stranded DNA most likely has to get its DNA into the nucleus, and there it happens right there, and that's where it has to be transcribed and replicated. Now there is another strategy for getting out of um, a, an icosahedral capsid uh, exemplified by polio. And the, what we're doing here is we're making a pore in the capsid, and the RNA is coming out of the pore. So when poliovirus binds its receptor, that interaction is enough to get the RNA out of the pore. If you mix poliovirus with, it, with its purified receptor at 37 degrees, the RNA will come out. So apparently the receptor is enough to trigger some conformational change. It triggers the spring in the virus that's loaded that lets the RNA out. So re remember, if the receptor isn't on a cell, this will not happen. So this is the control that the RNA will only come out in the right cell type. So what we think happens is the virus binds its receptor and is quickly taken up into a vesicle and very close to the cell surface, uh, the RNA is then ejected from the particle. Now getting out of the particle is easy because the receptor alone can do that. But then you have to get across the membrane, right, because you have to have some kind of a, a passageway. And we're, we think this happens uh, when the virus itself makes a pore. So here's a close-up view of, a, of poliovirus bound to its receptor. Here are two receptor molecules that are fitting into uh, the canyon uh, and the particle. Now, if you remember from last time, I told you there was a, a molecule of lipid uh, in, the, in the capsid. And in fact, that's what these curly molecules are here. When the receptor sits down into the capsid, it pushes out the lipid. The lipid leaves, so now the pocket here is empty. And that gives the capsid the room to move. It undergoes conformational changes. And two hydrophobic sequences that are normally hidden, these blue sequences, now they come out and make a hole or a pore in the membrane. 
So really this is all familiar, right? Because you're hiding the fusion proteins in the interior until they're needed. And what's the signal for them being needed? The right receptor that sits down and pushes the lipid out and allows those fusion peptides to come around. Now this lipid can be taken advantage of as, as an antiviral. In fact, there, there is a series of antiviral drugs that were selected by their ability to push the lipid out of that pocket. Let's go back one slide. Here's the lipid sitting in here. The receptor pushes it out. A series of antivirals were developed that displace the lipid and fit in here so tightly that the receptor can't displace them. And this is an example of such a compound bound in the pocket where the lipid would normally be. And this displaces the lipid, pushes the lipid out, and it binds with such high affinity that when this virus now sits on a cell receptor, it can't uncoat its RNA. So that's why it's an antiviral compound. Here's another view of the lipid sitting in the, the viral. This is one of the viral subunits uh, of the capsid. Uh, the receptor would be fitting in right here above it and would push the lipid out. If the antiviral drug is there, it can't push it out because it binds with too high affinity. Uh, the reason we know all this is because these drugs have been used to study virus entry extensively. They are worthless as antivirals, unfortunately, because as soon as you treat people with them, you get resistance. It's very easy to get single amino acid changes uh, in, the, in the pocket here that exclude the drug from binding. So even though they're a failure clinically, they've been great for telling us how uh, these viruses get into cells. Here's a, um, a crystal structure, an x-ray structure of poliovirus with these drugs bound to it. All right, so the yellow is each drug bound in the pocket just below where the receptor would be binding. And remember, there's 60 receptor binding sites per capsid. There are 60 drug binding sites per capsid as well. This is all predicted by icosahedral symmetry. So here, for example, is a five-fold axis of symmetry. You can see one, two, three, four, five kind of copies of the protein around that five-fold axis. And there are five copies of the drug bound uh, in the pocket around it as well. <clears throat> I want to tell you one example of uh, the, uh, a co-receptor or a second protein that's required for infection. And this goes back to Coxsackie virus, uh, which uses this molecule called CAR. Now, Coxsackie viruses uh, use two receptors to get in cells. They use CAR, which is the one shared with adenovirus, and they also use another protein called DAF. Now, Coxsackie viruses, like many other viruses, initiate infection at epithelial surfaces, respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract. But CAR is not on the surface of the epithelium. CAR is a tight junction component. It's buried in here. But it's necessary for virus infection. So how does the virus bind to it if it's located in here? Well, that's where DAF comes into play. It turns out that DAF is present on the apical side of epithelial cells. So DAF is up here. CAR is here in the tight junction. When Coxsackie virus binds to DAF, it starts a signal transduction pathway. It starts to signal through kinases and adapter molecules, and that ends up loosening up the cytoskeleton of the cell and loosens up the tight junction. So basically, virus binding to DAF loosens up the tight junction so the virus can now move into it and bind to CAR. Isn't that brilliant? So the Receptor is inaccessible, so instead the virus has evolved to bind to a cell surface molecule, and that binding loosens up the tight junction. So that's why Coxsackie viruses need uh, two receptors. And finally, um, the entry of real virus is worth mentioning, because this is an illustration of a virus that never really uh, gets rid of its RNA from the capsid. So real viruses are double-stranded RNA-containing viruses. They have a double icosahedral shell. They bind a receptor. They're taken up by endocytosis. Now, where most viruses will leave the endosome as the pH drops, because remember, um, at the end of the endocytic pathway, what happens to an endosome is it fuses with a lysosome. 
right? And that's full of proteolytic enzymes and nucleases, and most viruses want to get out before the lysosome step. So that's why low pH gets them out. However, real viruses stay there. They are gluttons for punishment. Uh, they stay in all the way to the end, and what happens is the enzymes in the lysosome digest away the outer capsid of real virus. But the virus doesn't mind because it's got a second capsid below it, right? The first one is stripped off. The second capsid is there. That second capsid is very hydrophobic, and it just punches right through uh, the wall of the lysosome. Brilliant, right? So that's why this virus has two concentric shells, because the second one is left after the digestion, and that gets it into the um, cytoplasm. Now, mRNA synthesis then occurs in this core, in this core particle that's left. The genome is still in there and never gets out. We'll talk more about that next time, but the, the RNA synthesis then occurs in here, and the mRNAs come out so they can be translated uh, in the cytoplasm. It's really, really a brilliant uh, strategy. So this is sort of a summary of, of most of what we've talked about. We've talked about fusion at the plasma membrane, where the nucleocapsid remains close by, um, or the capsid is transported down to the nucleus. We've talked about endocytic pathways in, in very broad ways. There are different kinds of endocytic pathways. This is not so important. Uh, but to just simply to know that as these vesicles move in, they become acidified, and that helps viruses to get out uh, of the pathway. So here you see there are clathrin-dependent uh, endocytic pathways. There's clathrin and caviolin-independent, and there are also uh, caviolin-dependent pathways. But all of them get the particles uh, into the cell. The last thing I want to mention very briefly is this step uh, where viruses have to get their genomes in the nucleus. Remember, pretty much all the DNA viruses, with two exceptions, pox viruses and Mimi viruses, have to get their DNA into the nucleus. Uh, the pox and the Mimi, the biggest viruses, they set up their own thing in the cytoplasm. They don't bother with the nucleus. So this is an obligatory step for most DNA viruses. And here's how it happens. We've talked about two ways that this happens today. Let me give you uh, two more. Influenza virus. It's unusual because it's an RNA virus, yet it has to get its genome in the nucleus to replicate. Why that's so, we'll talk about next time. Uh, it does so by being transported through the nuclear pore. Remember, the virus uncoats in the endosome, and then its, its RNPs, its ribonuclear proteins or its helical capsids, are really small, and they can fit right through the nuclear pore, which, as you know, can transport material of a certain size into the nucleus. Most viruses are too big to cross the pore. The exception are the parvoviruses, shown in the last panel, which are small enough to fit right through the pore, and they can be transported in, and then they uncoat their DNA in the nucleus. But other viruses are too big, uh, and so they have to take other strategies. Here uh, is what herpes virus does. Uh, remember, we talked about the portal at one of the five-fold axes of herpes virus last time. It's a hole through which the DNA comes. Uh, this virion is docked onto a nuclear pore, and the DNA is being threaded into the nucleus. And what the signal for that is, we don't know. It would be a very interesting thing to find out. Adenovirus we talked about. Remember, adenovirus begins to be partially disassembled in the, cap in the uh, endosome. It breaks through the endosome, partially disassembled. That's shown here. Moves to the nuclear pore, and then it docks on it, and again, the genome is pulled in. There's some evidence uh, adenovirus DNA is coated with various proteins, and there's some evidence that these uh, serve as tethers for nuclear proteins to pull the DNA into the nucleus. So uh, four different ways of getting nucleic acid into the nucleus. So that is really an overview of how viruses get in. Now, in the next two sessions, we're going to talk about genome replication and mRNA synthesis. <laughs>